So generally when you get a crown back from the lab, it's going to be polished and it's going to seat on your die, right? So your die is a, bless you, is a replica of what you have in the mouth, okay? So the lab will have polish and adjusted so that fits that. So you want to take that crown and now see if it fits onto your prep tooth correctly. So you'll take the provisional off, you'll clean off the temp cement, and then you'll go and try to seat the crown onto the tooth. Okay? So there's a certain order in which we want you to kind of have this mental checklist of things to, to check. Um, so there's a logical sequence in which why we've ordered it this way. The first thing that you want to check is your interproximal contacts. And the reason for this is if your interproximal contacts are too tight, or another way to think about it is if your crown is too wide for the space that you have there, well, the crown isn't going to seat down all the way. So some of you guys experienced this yesterday when you guys milled out your onlays, and then you try to kind of jam it home, and it was a tight fit, and it wouldn't pop out easily, right? That's because probably when we designed our crowns, we had obviously a positive interproximal contact. It was just probably a little too tight for that space. And guess what happens to that margin? The margin is open because you can't get the crown down all the way. Okay? So an ideal interproximal contact should have that floss kind of pop in and out just like it would for any other teeth adjacent to it. So a good way to check for this is, let's say you have a crown on number 19, right? So you've taken that provisional off. What I tend to do is I check the interproximal contacts of two adjacent teeth that are intact. So I'll test maybe um, 20 and 21, so between the premolars. And I'll get a feel of how that feels, okay? I'll go try to seat my crown on, and then I will go back and check between 20 and 21. And if it feels the same, that's probably a good indication that that crown isn't pushing on the neighboring tooth, okay? Um, the other way to check is to just hold the crown down, have somebody help you hold the crown down, and then floss on the interproximal contact between 19 and 20. So you'll do that for the mesial surface and for the distal. And if your floss is tearing, that probably means that it's too tight, okay? So then what you want to do then is you want to take some articulating paper and then wedge it between the tooth and then the crown, and then you'll have a little mark on the interproximal portion, right? So you'll see the mark down there, and then you want to adjust that mark. So the question is, well, how much do you adjust? Um, I think it's hard to kind of verbally communicate how much to adjust. It's one of those things that I feel like you kind of need to do a few of these to get a feel of how much material that removes. Because I could say, oh, run it at this many RPMs for like two seconds. But everybody's going to push a little differently, right? If I say lightly adjust, like what does lightly mean? You know, some people have heavy hands, some people are light, some people are super conservative and they're like deathly afraid to touch anything. And some just go to town, right? Um, so again, it goes back to this idea is that the more clinical experience you kind of play around with this, you'll kind of get an idea of how much material is being taken off. So it's a trial and error thing until you get a feel for how abrasive these um, burrs are, okay? Um, so don't be afraid to over adjust, you know? This is the time to over adjust things because then you'll learn that was running too fast or you're pushed a little too hard or you kind of went at it for too long, okay? And if you're sitting there for two hours and still not getting the interproximal contacts right, that probably means you're too conservative, right? And you're afraid of messing up or you just have a light touch, right? Um, so there's all things that you just got to, it's part of the learning process. I don't know if there's a good way to accelerate that other than doing that yourself, okay? But conceptually, that's what we're trying to get after, right? Adjust your interproximal contact such that the crown will seat down so that floss, so floss is essentially your kind of ultimate test to see if that contact's adjusted appropriately. Okay? So after that, so once our interproximal contacts um, are satisfactorily adjusted, 
Then you want to take your Explorer and just run it around the crown, the buckle and lingle, where you have good access to that tooth, and just check that that tip of that Explorer margin doesn't get wedged in between your tooth and then your crown. Okay? So you want to check that it's sealed all the way around. And then if it's super gingival, obviously you can visually inspect it. Okay? If you can take that tip of the Explorer, get in between, and then lift up, and the crown comes up, we would say that's an open margin, and that's not acceptable. Sometimes you can feel the transition between the two materials, and as long as it's sealed, you're okay. okay? So not all the time is it like a perfect, seamless you know, um, transition between the two materials. Sometimes at some point, you'll feel maybe just a little you know, difference in sort of the um, transition between the tooth and the crown. Okay? So your interproximal contacts, or sorry, the interproximal margins in your mesial and distal, if there's a tooth adjacent to it, it's hard to sneak your explorer in there, and it's hard to visually see, right? So in order to confirm that those areas are seated down all the way, we ask that you take a radiograph, a bite wing radiograph, so that you can check to see that that is down all the way. And we'll have a picture at some point of what an open margin would look like. Okay? So interproximal contacts first, check with floss, check your margin to make sure it's sealed, and then take a radiograph to check your interproximal contacts. So if you have a standalone tooth, let's say number 19 is all by itself, do you need a radiograph to confirm the seat? No, because you can take your explorer and just feel all the way around the tooth to see that the margins are sealed, all right? Okay, so let's say our margin is sealed, or let's say for some reason the margin isn't sealed, but our interproximal contacts look pretty good. One thing that can happen, and it rarely does because the lab generally adjusts these out before they send it back to you, because they'll be able to check the internal fit onto the die, is sometimes you have these little blebs or bubbles on the internal surface. And most commonly, they'll be found um, at these line angles, because that's where things, air bubbles and things like that, get trapped. Okay? So if you want to rule that out as a possible source of error, you can put a little bit of this spray. So th in this case, this is a red spray. And spray it on the inside of your crown. And then you can seat that onto the tooth. So the area that that is binding there'll be, you know, that mark there from the spray will be rubbed off. Everywhere that it's not touching will still have that spray intact. Okay, so if your margin isn't sealed but your interproximal contacts are okay, you may want to check the internal fit just to rule that out as a possibility. And again, this, um, I've rarely had to adjust the inside of a casting because uh, generally the lab will also do this step. Um, before they send it to you, because they'll check it on the die, um, on the actual die, right? Remember the die we put, uh, what do we put on the die? It's almost like a nail polish thing, right? A die spacer. So as they're checking for that, sometimes you'll actually see part of the die spacer kind of chipping off or rubbing off. That usually clues you in that, oh, something is rubbing um, that shouldn't be touching there, okay? All right, so getting back to marginal seal, here are some radiographs, just some examples of open margin. So obviously you can see that there's a discrepancy between the uh, tooth. You see that it doesn't just flow. There's a big gap right there. And then there's another example of an over-contoured margin. So there's pictures on the right just to depict um, the differing, um, we talked about sub-margins, open margins, um, and a little overhang. Right? Okay. So let's go back and let's talk about marginal seal. What if at this point your margin does not seal, uh, but you've checked the internal fit and you've checked the interproximal contact? Um, when you kind of think through the logical pr progression then, then the next thing I want to ask myself is, well, 
Did, does the crown fit the die accurately? Okay. So I'll check back the crown onto the die. And if the die looks appropriate, then I know, well, the lab probably did a good job because that's all they have to go by. They don't have the actual tooth there. The other source of error could be in the trimming of the die. Remember we marked the margin with that red pencil? Sometimes if your impression isn't great and you don't have that good distinct separation, you may be guessing at where that margin ends or begins. So if you want to rule that out, then you may want to pour just a separate die there and then trim it yourself and then see if that crown fits that die. Okay? So everything that you get back, you kind of want to you know, think through like where the error could have been. Because um, if it fits the die well, well, that's all really the lab technician has to go off of. Okay? So at some point you want to kind of figure out, okay, is it an error on my part? Or is it the error on the lab end? Because if it's the lab end, you can send it back and point out. So part of what we, so at as I don't know if you guys talked to a lot of people from other schools, but we do hardly any lab work. So you guys are on like the, if there's a spectrum, right, you're in like the very left side, like the bottom 1% of lab work of all dental students, okay? Which some people are thrilled by because we don't enjoy lab work. The downside of that, I would say, is a lot of these lab communication kind of experiences or principles, we kind of lose out on the sense that we're not really confident on what's going on. Like, we put this impression in a little black box. Two weeks later, we get it back. And we don't know how it turned into a crown, but there's something magical that goes on in that black box. Okay? So if we're not going to have you guys do the actual lab work, we at least want to have you guys have the understanding of what they're doing and to identify whether it's a lab issue or your issue, okay? Because if you're able to do that, then at least you can communicate with the lab a little bit more confidently. Like they're not, you're gonna, they're not gonna pick up the phone and after they hang them go like, this doctor has no idea what the hell he's doing, right? And that happens, because if you aren't familiar with sort of the actual lab steps, who knows where the error goes wrong? Think about, remember we outlined all the different steps that we have in making a casting? There's like 20 of them, right? Um, so when you have a crown that doesn't fit in the mouth, but it seems like your interproximal contacts are good and your internal fit is good, the things that go through my mind are, does it fit the die? Yes or no? Is the margin trimmed well? And I'll go back and look at my impression and evaluate my impression. Did I give the lab an easy time trimming the die? Or... In dental school, I think it's important, and we don't require you guys to do this, but if I were in charge, I'd have you guys trim your first five dies that you guys prep. One, just so you can have the experience and realize how difficult it is, and two, it helps you really value the importance of a nice impression with a clean margin and sulcus, because that act of trimming the die, sometimes you get to this fuzzy spot where you're not exactly sure if that's the margin or if that's soft tissue. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm just curious, how, how often would you say you run into problems for the lab? I'm sure it depends on the lab and their quality of work, but I mean, is that like a regular occurrence that the lab could make a mistake? Or is no, I wouldn't say it's regular, but when it does happen, right, you don't want to pick up the phone and go, oh, you guys screwed up, when all of a sudden it's actually your fault, like you had a bad impression. Yeah. Um, and it'd be interesting to see maybe some of our uh, adjunct faculty and their experience with labs. Um, you want to speak a little bit about that and yeah. your experience? All right. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of the sequence that you kind of want to think through. Okay? So, marginal seal. And then at the end of that, then, you know, we know that the margin's seated. We know that the interproximal contacts are okay. Then you want to check your occlusal contacts. So, again, the sequence I generally do is I leave the crown off at first and I put articulating paper anterior and posterior to the prep. So where the natural teeth are occluding. I have them close, and I'll kind of tug on that paper. And I'll see if that, generally most of the time, that paper is going to hold, right? Because teeth generally are in contact. Okay? So I just verify that first. Then I'll go put my crown on uh, to the tooth, and I'll go back and check the adjacent contacts again. So if that articulating paper now pulls through on the adjacent teeth, what does that tell you about the crown? 
It's in hyperocclusion. So you want to mark the tooth, and then you can start to adjust those contacts. Something else I'll do, too, is before I start adjusting in the mouth, I'll actually test it on the articulator first. Right? Again, the articulator is uh, meant to simulate what the patient's mouth does. Okay? And uh, the reason I like to do that is one is sometimes they'll leave it in a little bit of hyperocclusion, then you know you can adjust it extra, um, you know, you're adjusting extra early anyways. But the other thing too is that the paper um, is not in this oral environment. Sometimes it marks a little clearly on the crown. So just before you even start adjusting anything, you want to have a good mental picture of where the opposing teeth are hitting your crown. Okay. Because you think you, some of you guys experience this where you mark the paper and all of a sudden you have all these smudge marks on there. And you see a bunch of red or a bunch of blue on the crown, and then you're not entirely sure which ones are your true marks. Right? Sometimes we get those false marks. But if you have tested on an articulating or an articulator, and you know exactly, you can visualize the opposing cusp hitting in that marginal ridge right there, then in your mind you have a good idea of or exactly to adjust. And actually now with these digitally fabricated um, crowns, so for example your CEREC, right, you're dragging the tooth contours until you have certain colors, either like green or yellow, because that signifies the intensity of the contact, right? You can ask your lab to just give you a snapshot or a screenshot of their proposal, their design proposal, send that as part of the lab case back to you, then you can have this piece of paper that has sort of a map as to where most likely those contacts are going to be occurring. So you know exactly what part of the tooth to bring down. Okay. All right. So another little tip is when you get in the intra oral environment, um, if you lightly paint uh, a layer of Vaseline onto the articulating paper, it tends to transfer onto your teeth on your crowns a little bit more clearly. Sometimes with a nice polished ceramic, for example, it's hard for that articulating paper to transfer onto uh, the other material. So that's just a little tip. All right? So occlusal contacts, um, you know, you adjust them like you have been in terms of your collaboration exercises. Uh, so that's something you'll get good at. And again, it's one of those things that you kind of start off slow, take a little bit, and then you'll start to get a feel of how much you're adjusting each time you're touching that surface, OK? Um, so once you have the occlusal contacts figured out and you're happy with that, then you want to look at your crown contours. So this one, this radiograph, you would say, oh, the crown's probably sealed, but we have a huge overhang, right? The crown contours are not acceptable. So crown contours should be evaluated to ensure cleansability as well as aesthetics. Uh, most errors in contour are found in the embrasure spaces. And before you cement anything in the anterior, you want them to approve of the look and the size and the shape. Right? So you hand them a mirror and go, OK, we have this whole form that um, a crown approval form that our patients here at the school will go through and sign just to say, OK, you're happy with it. Because once it goes on permanently, we're not going to be able to take it off. Yes. Yeah, we'll do that probably this afternoon because um, some of the designs have been coming out over contoured from our online. I guess that when we're, when we're milling it, when mm -hmm. we're trying to design it, but we provide, we make our crown prep and we take an impression of that, how mm -hmm. does it become over contoured based on that impression that we then pour up the crown and all of that? So the over contour will be, in, for example, a gold crown, it's going to be in their wax up phase, right? If you build that wax a little too big or when they stack the porcelain, it's going to be more bulbous than we want, OK? So um, yeah, that's when things kind of go, all right, it's either in the wax up stage or when they stack the porcelain. In our case, it's when we drag, you know, when we use our shape tool and kind of make it too wide or something like that, OK? Or a lot of times, actually, in our circ proposals, they come over contoured. We don't do a good job of bringing things in is generally what happens, OK? So yeah. I'll, I, We'll have some photos by the end of the day, probably, of some over-contoured. Okay? Um, so you want to verify that everything looks good, that they're happy with it. So they'll sign. we have a little f special form that they'll fill out. Okay, sometimes, so we keep talking about 
heavy interproximal contacts, and we can just adjust those down, right? What if the interproximal contact is too light, or you've over-adjusted? What can we do to solve that problem? Well, we know, for example, a PFM or any ceramic, we can layer on a lower fusing ceramic, right? So if you know what contact, let's say the mesocontacts are light, then you'll take a little bit of this porcelain, put it in the interproximal region, and then you can put it back in the oven and it'll fire and you'll have more porcelain there, so to seal up that contact, okay? So the key there, remember, is you have to use a lower fusing porcelain than any of the other porcelains you had originally start with so that you don't disturb that base layer of porcelain, okay? Um, with metal, we can essentially solder on and add a little bit of metal in that interproximal contact. So you take a little bit of this extra metal, and then the principle is you heat it up real hot, and it won't disturb the metal crown, but it'll just heat up the solder so that it fuses into the new metal. Um, so soldering, I mean, it's, I don't think you'll ever solder yourself so we won't go through all the steps and the principles in uh, much detail, but just to know in your head when you're communicating with the lab, if you have a metal crown that all of a sudden the interproximal contacts aren't sufficient, you can send it back and ask them to solder to it, okay? Um, so what's interesting is if you have an open contact, right, intraorally, but it, and you check that crown onto the die, right, so sometimes you'll have the, uh, well, a lot of times you'll put it on the die and you'll find, oh, there's an open contact on the die as well, right? Then you can tell the lab, okay, add until that is closed on the die. But sometimes you'll take that crown, put it onto the die, and find that it's perfectly sealed or perfectly closed. But when you put it in the mouth, there's that little discrepancy. So what are some potential reasons why there's a discrepancy between your stone and then your mouth. Bad impression, okay, so there's this, some distortion impression that makes up the difference, okay? They like cut the dye and move it in Okay, so maybe they abraded the dye, okay? Anything else? Drifting. Teeth drifting, right? So those are all good possibilities of why you have a difference between the stone Right. So to solve that issue, who said that they maybe abraded the dye? It was you? Okay. So one way to check for that is, so remember we have a sectioned or pindex model. Well, uh, a lot of times the lab, and the lab here, or Awatsuki will do this for us, they'll pour a second um, uh, cast that they don't pindex at all. Okay, so we'll call that a solid model because it's not cut up. So after they've made the crown, they'll take that same crown and check it onto the solid model that hasn't been sectioned at all, okay? So you eliminate the error that Mark is talking about, right? The potential abrading of the dye, either by the act of suctioning it, right? When you have it on the pindex thing, there's a little bit of movement. But also what happens is every time you check it, you know, you have this casting, you take it on and off, Sometimes the interproximal contacts get abraded a bit, okay? Um, so a solid model will help kind of rule that out, okay? Um, so if a crown comes back and it's um, well, it's closed on the die, but it's open in the mouth, what you can do is just you kind of arbitrarily scrape the interproximal contact of the die, and then you can send it back to the lab and say, okay, close it to that contour, okay? So it's a little bit of a guessing game, but you can scrape and maybe over. So you visualize what the space is in the mouth, and then you take it back to your cast, and then you kind of arbitrarily scrape it to get about the same amount of distance. And if anything, you want to over scrape just so you have a little positive contact that you can then take back down. Okay, because you don't want to have it send it back, add, and find out they didn't add enough. Then you got to have them add again. Yes. Or you can take a, a new impression will be difficult for that crown to seat on to the new, because uh, the, P, even though it's PVS, it's hard to get a casting to fit back on a completely different impression, even though it's the same prep, because the 
discrepancy that you'll have is can be enough to kind of hold it up. Okay, so I wouldn't trust that. Um, a more kind of advanced technique would be a, what they call a pickup impression, where you have the crown on the tooth in the mouth, and then you make an impression of that, and then the crown ends up embedded in your impression. Okay, um, so we generally don't do that, but that's another way to do it. Uh, the interproximal contact of the adjacent tooth, oh. right? Yeah, because on the cast there's no space, but in the mouth there is space. So you're trying to replicate the space that you see in the mouth on the stone cast. On the stone, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, then we talk about okay. So let's say everything is fine. Interproximal contacts are good. Margins are sealed. Uh, Occlusion is fine. We have our contour and aesthetics all check out. Then we're ready to cement, right? And we've talked about this quite a bit. Um, and we'll just run through this again. Basically, you have two differing types of cements um, or categories you can organize in your head. One is eluding agents, which is our resin modified glass ionomer. And we're going to use that for our uh, casting in this situation. And basically, the purpose of that is just to fill the space in between the crown and the tooth, OK? And you form a seal. And the other is an adhesive cement or a resin cement. We're essentially gluing that to the tooth. Okay. So you guys know all the steps for that. The looting agent that we use is called Fuji Sem 2. It's the RMGI. Uh, here's some properties that we've, or the history behind it. So they start off with glass ionomer. They found that there were certain properties that weren't ideal. So they added some resin to it to make it a little bit more ideal. So I'll let you guys read through that yourself. Okay, so the advantage of using ArmGI, of course, are that it's not technique sensitive at all, right? You just load it in, seat at home, and then the advantage of that is if you have to, if you ever have to take off the crown, you can just section the crown, and you break the seal, and then the crown will lift off. And we're going to go through that exercise today. Okay, so you're going to seat the crown, or get everything adjusted, cement the crown, let that set, then we're going to go through and we'll show you how to section it and then wedge it open, OK? So looting versus bonding, you guys know all this. But basically, the two principles are if you've got deficient uh, retention resistance form, you want to bond a ceramic crown versus uh, looting. And also, if you encroach that minimal thickness for the ceramic crown, then you can increase that with uh, the resin cement. Uh, and this is primarily for Emacs and Empress. So let's run through this real quick. So up here we have five different types of crowns that we'll prescribe in our clinic. There's a lot more materials out there in the industry, but we these are the five that you'll see um, at our clinic here. So on the left you'll have just a full gold crown. Uh, right next to that is a porcelain fused to metal. Then you have your Empress, which is a probably the weakest of our all ceramic materials. Emax, which you guys are more familiar with. Uh, so that goes in the purple state to the uh, tooth colored if you're milling it. But you can also press it. Right? Remember the pressing procedure? So it's like the loss, it's a loss wax technique where you're waxing up a tooth. But instead of heating up metal and then casting to it, you are heating up this ingot of ceramic that gets molten, and then that gets pressed into that investment material. Okay. So Emacs and Empress can be made those two ways. You can either mill it from a block, or you can have this molten ingot of that ceramic and pressed into place. So what's the advantages versus disadvantage of the press versus mill procedures? So who wants to take a stab at that? What would be an advantage of pressing? Yes. Right. So pressing, you tend to have a uh, what we call better adaptation to the dye. Okay. Because think about the process of that. You take a piece of the dye, dip it in some wax. That wax is really tightly secured onto that prep. Okay. It matches that surface perfectly, let's say. Whereas milling, you'll have areas where the burr will over mill in certain areas just because of the nature of the fabrication process. 
So you would say that the adaptation to that dye isn't as good. And if you have any thinner areas, let's say, right, and I think that's what you're trying to get at, is that the wax is able to capture that much better than a milled process, okay? So you'd say adaptation for a pressed um, uh, crown is going to be much better. So this applies when you guys have your gold crowns come back. Some of you guys will have a little bit of a sloppy fit, or it's not well adapted. That's because our wax patterns have been milled. If we were to do it the traditional way, I would guarantee all of our wax patterns would be fitting onto your dye and your tooth much more snugly. You don't have as much room to rotate. So I would say the ones that you're getting back are pretty much minimally acceptable, where it's not, you know, it'll pass in a patient's mouth, but not as good as what we can get it. If yes? If we have that problem, then we'd probably want to cement instead of loop if you have some resistance for it. You if know, you're using, it. right, some sort of all ceramic, that'd be one option is if you're worried about the amount of di virtual dye spacer that you added and it over milled and you got a loose fit, then you would say that we don't have sufficient retention resistance form and you can enhance that with bonding, correct, okay? Um, but the, what's the advantage of milling it then? Time and money, right? So you don't have to go through all the steps of waxing, investing, burning out, and all that. You can just punch it into a computer and have it do its thing, and it'll just grind it out. Okay. Would you say maybe aesthetics would be a little bit better on pressing over milling, or any more? That's not the case. Um, at the end, you get the same block. So let's say you waxed up a crown contour, and then you design the same exact one. Oh, so you're using the same block. Right. Right. So you can enhance that by layering porcelain, but you can layer porcelain on either the milled or pressed, okay? Um, okay, and then we have zirconia, which it has to be milled. Zirconia, you can't melt this ingot and then press it into place. So remember, zirconia, you mill out an oversized crown, right? It's bigger than what it should be. And then when you go center it, what happens to it? It shrinks up, and it forms this orderly crystalline structure. So from Empress Emax Zirconia, that's also ordered in the order of strength. So Empress is our weakest, we get to our Zirconia, and that's the strongest, okay? So um, think about the difference between a milled Zirconia versus a milled Emax or Empress, right? Because the Zirconia starts off larger, even if you over mill certain areas, because it shrinks back down, the overmilling is not as significant as milling at a one to one kind of scale or your Emacs or Empress block, right? So when you throw that Emacs block in the furnace, the dimension of the crown doesn't change, it just crystallizes, okay? Whereas zirconia, you actually get shrinkage of that. So even though there may be a large error in the overmilling, by the time it shrinks, it's not as magnified. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. So that's the process of making it. So let's break these down and figure out what's on the inside of these materials. So a casting, a full uh, metal, is all metal underneath. A PFM is also metal. And then our Empress and Emacs is made up primarily of a glassy phase. Whereas your zirconia has virtually no glassy phase, it's all crystalline, okay? So that helps kind of answer whether we want to loot or bond these into place. So the options that are metal and crystalline, we know that our resin cement doesn't really physically bond to those two surfaces, okay? Um, they do make some special cements that technically could bond to metal, right? They have a certain primer that will bond, but we don't use that. So for our metal and zirconia crowns, it doesn't make sense to try to bond those because there's nothing that that resin cement will bond to the crown to. So we would say that those two, those three crowns should be looted in a place with a resin modified glass ionomer or a looting agent, okay? What about Empress? So we know Empress is our weaker ceramic and it needs the support of a solid foundation. So that one we have to bond into place. We're going to use a resin cement all the time, okay? Emacs, on the other hand, is the one that we have this option to loot or bond. And again, that's going to go back to those two criteria that we have, or three if you want to add in color, but does it have sufficient retention resistance form? 
And then the other is, have we achieved a minimal thickness for strength? Okay? So that's how you should organize these materials um, into place. Of course, there's always exceptions. For example, some companies are coming out with new cements that will bond to zirconia. So Ceramer is a specific brand type that has a certain primer that will attach to the crystalline structure. But in general, I want you guys to organize these materials and these concepts in this way. OK? Does that make sense? OK, so uh, there's just a little bit about temp cements. These are just uh, rehashed from our other um, lectures. But uh, one thing I do want to know is the disadvantage of using a resin cement, although it acts like glue, is that the film thickness of the cement is generally larger than our other cements. Meaning, how if you push two things together and you add cement in between them, how thin can you make that layer of cement? That's our film thickness. So the disadvantage of a resin cement, you would say that uh, you can't kind of compress or thin out that cement as much, uh, potentially leading to you know, a wider gap in those areas. So the idea is you want to minimize that so that that crown kind of fits and seals that tooth as best as we can. All right, let's finish up here. Um, we have a little exercise that involves endodontically treated teeth with amalgam. So the whole principle here is, um, and I start off with this picture, we'll jump back to the beginning of the slide, is that when you have, it's rare that you get a tooth that has untouched and then you're prepping for a crown, right? Most of the time, the reason it needs a crown is because it's had some problems with it in the past. So usually it starts off with some sort of decay either in the occlusal, the interproximal, and then you start off with you know, a restoration, MOD, something like that, and then that fails, and then at some point some cusps are undermined, and sometimes it'll lead to a root canal, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but the idea is that you've, it's been previously restored to some respect. Okay? So it's very rare that you get, or it's, I wouldn't say very rare, but sometimes you do it for aesthetics or whatever, but um, it's, yeah, pretty rare that you get a untouched tooth that you need to prepare down for a crown, okay? So the question is, when we have lost tooth structure, um, we need to replace it before we put the crown on top. So, for example, you have an endodontically treated tooth and you've got a big hole in the middle of it. Right? And you have, let's say, a cusp broken off, and you have this MOD prep that you have. Well, we want to build that tooth back up to its original contour so that then we can prep it for a crown and make uh, a crown that'll fit like you normally would in our, what we've been doing the past two months, right? So there's a f several different materials that we can use to build up this crown. And what we're going to show you today is this amalgam buildup by using the core of an endodontically treated teeth tooth to help hold it in. Okay? So we know with amalgam, amalgam doesn't actually attach to the tooth. There's no bond to it. Whereas a composite, you can etch, bond, and it'll actually adhere to the tooth. Right? Better to enamel than dentin, but you get some sort of um, micromechanical bond to it. Whereas amalgam, what are we a lot relying on with amalgam to get that to stay? There's a mechanical retention. So we're looking at opposing walls and um, converging walls, right? So it locks in so it won't pop out. Basically, we're designing this preparation such that there's, once that amalgam solidifies, there's no path in which that amalgam piece can be removed, right? There's no path of withdrawal because you got undercuts everywhere, okay? So when you have an endodontically treated tooth, and we're talking about posterior tooth here, that has a big pulp chamber that goes in, you know, pretty deep into the tooth, well, we can use that to our advantage and have the amalgam sink down in there and kind of lock itself in. And then we also have a few walls that, you know, we can rely on um, for it to help hold. Okay. So that's sort of the principle here is that um, how are we going to get this amalgam to stay in? Well, we can use this endodontically treated tooth with the pulp chamber and the walls to help um, 
hold that in. Okay? So this is maybe a typical example of a tooth that will be they'll present to you in clinic and it's been root canaled and then you want to do a build up before you prep it for a crown. Right? Obviously if you just prep this for a crown without building it up, it's gonna look a little funny. It's got all these like weird features in it, right? It's gonna be much easier to fabricate a crown when it looks like this. Right? So if somebody was colorblind they would just think, oh, this is a normal crown prep. Okay. So Chad, yeah, it looks like a crown prep to you, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, but you can see that there's a little bit of amalgam here that kind of makes up that missing tooth structure. So here's the exercise, basically. Um, so the principle here is that when a tooth has been endodontically treated, a chamber retained core buildup should be considered to improve retention of the core buildup material. When three or more walls remain in, with a minimal thickness of one millimeter following uh, crown preparation, this technique is ideal to provide a strong foundation for the casting. Um, a post, which we'll get into tomorrow, should only be considered when other forms of retention are inadequate. If only two walls of adequate tooth structure remain, one or more posts or other retentive features will be required. Furthermore, the combination of one post and two coronal radicular spaces can be frequently utilized in molars. So basically it's saying if you've got enough walls, just throw the amalgam in there. If that's not enough, you want to put a post. All right. So here's the exercise. You're going to start with an endodontically true tooth, the molar, and then you're going to fix it to your typodont. Um, do you guys still have those endotypodonts with, you guys know how to do this. Do you guys do this for your exams and stuff? Okay, we'll fi um, before we get going, I'll talk to Pedro about how we want to do this. But the idea is that you're going to fix this tooth into some sort of stent or something so you can work on it while you're working, okay? Uh, then the idea is that you're going to fill this cavity here, or the access opening, with wax. So you're going to build it up to what the tooth should look like. And I want you to do that because I want you to make a putty stent of that so that you have a matrix to make a provisional. So obviously your provisional shouldn't capture a big hole in it. We want it to look like a tooth. All right, following so far? Pretty easy? Okay, so fill with wax, make a putty, uh, let that set, and then you can fish the, uh, the wax out. Okay, so you have a putty index of what that tooth should look like. And you can just carve in a little anatomy if you want, make it sort of look like a tooth. Okay, then um, you're gonna pretend that this tooth has been previously restored so you're going to prep in an MOD, and then you're just going to knock off a cusp. So we'll say, I'll let you pick a cusp, but maybe like a mesial buckle cusp or whatever. Okay? So this is to simulate that the tooth has been extensively damaged, that it carries, and it needed some root canal. Okay? Clinically, what you want to do at this stage is, so generally what happens is a patient will present, oh, I got a big cavity in my mouth, it's hurting. You go and you remove the decay. At this point, after caries removal, you want to determine the restorability of the tooth. Okay. So this is before any root canal treatment. You want to determine the restorability of the tooth. So you'll work with your clinic faculty, and again, there's a myriad of different scenarios where we won't be able to go through each one. But some of the principles you're looking at is, well, how many walls do I have? What are the height of those walls? And at some point, you're going to decide, okay, I can build it up and put a crown and it's going to be fine. Sometimes you'll run into a situation where you'd say, you know, there's just too much tooth missing. But there's no way a crown is going to hold on, okay? And you'll decide, okay, we should probably extract this tooth. So the idea is you want to determine the restorability of the tooth before you do any root canal treatment. Because what you don't want to do, and this happens from time to time, either at the school or even your private office, is you encounter a tooth and you go, oh, it's into the pulp, decays into the pulp, send them out for a root canal. Patient pays however much money for a root canal, and they come back to your office, right? let's say you send out to an anodontist, or even you do it yourself, whatever, and then you go prep it for a crown, and you find out, oh, crap, this isn't going to hold, right? So the patient just spent $2,000 to see an endodontist for a root canal, and then you're going to tell them, oh, we're going to have to take out the tooth, right? So not a good situation to be in. So they're going to be like, oh, why'd you tell me you get a root canal and spend all this money when you're just going to take it out? Yes? Probably, yeah. You got to make them happy somehow. 
Um, sometimes the patients here are like so kind. They're like, oh, I'm a student. I need a root canal experience. Can I do a root canal? And then I'll take out the tooth. And sometimes that's how you get your root canal experience. So if you develop a good relationship with the patient, sometimes you talk about that. Um, but anyways, yeah, if you do it the other way and they like pay for something that they don't want to, I mean, we wouldn't charge a patient for a root canal, but uh, yeah, you're in some trouble, basically. Yeah, you're not making them happy. Usually monetarily is the easiest way. Um, so that's the idea. So sometimes a patient will come to you in pain, though, and you get in the pulp. At that point, you know, on an emergency basis, you can do like a, a pulpotomy. So you get them out of pain, but you probably don't want to spend the time or money to finish the root canal unless you know you're going to save that tooth, right? So this is a key principle to understand is that determining the restorability of the tooth is primary before you initiate any sort of endodontic treatment, okay? Clear about that? Makes sense, right? Um, so once you do that, and let's say it's restorable, then you want to finish your root canal, okay? Or start your root canal. So a couple principles here is that for this core amalgam to work, you want a millimeter uh, wall thickness, at least. Okay, so root canal uh, therapy is performed after the tooth has been deemed to be restorable. So once you got this prepped, you're gonna put a bold band around it and then um, condense amalgam and basically do a big complex amalgam, right? Um, at this point, if in our clinic setting, sometimes you don't have enough time to do the crown prep and all that today or in the same day, but you can do this and have the patient kind of go home and they're in a stable kind of a restored tooth, right? And then you can bring them back another day to complete the crown prep. So once you got into this stage, you know, it's a good breaking point if you're running low on time, you know, and then you can bring them back for another crown prep uh, appointment. If you're fast, you can do this real quick, let it set, and then you can uh, prep. Although it is hard to prep the amalgam soon after it kind of sets. It is a lot easier to bring them back the day after or once it comes to uh, a more complete set of the amalgam, right? So if you were to take a radiograph, you can see that the amalgam would penetrate into this uh, chamber. So that's sort of a visual I want you guys to see is that uh, that engages the internal part so this core buildup uh, made of amalgam doesn't just rotate out. Right? So amalgam extends into the pulp chamber. All right. So now you have this uh, thing that looks like a tooth if you're colorblind and now it's just a matter of prepping it for a crown like we always would. So for our exercise we're changing it this year. We're going to ask you to do a gold crown prep on this tooth. And then we're going to have you do a provisional and then seat the provisional onto the crown. Okay? And that's essentially, you know, simulating a clinic experience of uh, root canal builds up crown prep. Yes? So, so how, are you sort of No, no, no. You build it up to the. So this is before we've prepped for a crown, you're just going to build it up to like complex amalgam. If you wait long enough, yeah. Ideally, you'll wait even longer, but this is a simulation clinic. Where we're going to be okay if you okay. kind of cheat the process a bit. Yeah, okay. It, you know, you wait a good 20, 30 minutes. It'll come to some set that you can still... It'll be real soft still. Not as It would be softer than you would if you waited the next day. Um, if you want, you can kick this project to tomorrow and then prep it and then kind of get it in your CEREC if you want. But... Um, if you're sitting there twiddling your thumbs, just prep it. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So a good point is whenever we do any sort of build up, your margin where your crown seats on the margin should always be on tooth structure. Okay. So sometimes you have to drop your margin below the level of your build up material, whether it's amalgam or composite or whatever. So, for example, maybe this is a good picture here. So you see interproximal here? You see where my amalgam box is? Okay. You can't leave your margin at this junction. So if I didn't prep it as deep as I did, let's say I left it here, <clears throat> my crown margin would be sitting on that amalgam. Okay. So if I didn't prep and get past the amalgam on this box, right, so if I left the crown margin here, then that you'd have amalgam to crown a junction there. 
So you want to drop your crown margin beyond the level of your uh, build-up material. You always want your crown to sit on natural tooth structure circumferentially, right? Is that what you're getting at, Dr. Jeffy? Yes. You did that at this stage here with the wax. Would you put the wax up in the hole? Or would we put the wax? Where'd it go? What the hell is going on here? Here. Remember we said fill this with wax and then make a putty of this? Right? Okay, so you have your putty and then you have your this will seat back on in this prep, right? You with me now? Okay, good. So you can make a provisional and then seat that in the mouth with temp cement. Okay, clear for part one of this? All right, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that's the principle. Anytime you've exposed a pulp, you want to have that isolated well. Okay? Um, so great point there. You don't want the wrath of Lebo coming down on you. All right, so here's some of the feedback from the students in our clinic is that uh, this is great. It simulates some sort of uh, clinic experience. The other thing that we never really simulated that a lot of students got confused when they got down to the clinic floor was, um, so pretend there's a, temp a crown on this tooth, right? Uh, a lot of times you'll have a situation where there's recurrent decay under a actual crown that's already on the tooth. So let's think about this. The, the sequence that we treat that tooth is one, we have to remove the crown. So we're gonna suction the crown and then remove it. Yeah, question? Right. And then we fill it with wax and yep. we take an impression of that? Correct. Okay, so then we take the wax out and put amalgam in it and then make a crown prep? There, well, before you do that, you're going to simulate a broken down tooth by prepping an MOD oh, with a okay, so with a cut broken off. Okay, so right. and when we do that, we, we have to take the wax out for that? Yeah, yeah. The wax is there just so you can have a nice provisional. provisional, yeah. Okay, so we take the wax out, do an MOD, put amalgam everywhere. Yeah, I'll have you that see everybody. <laughs> Just so everybody. Okay, we okay we take the wax out, prep an M O D, <laughs> and then <laughs> fill it with amalgam, and then do the crown prep, and then use the impression that we made before to make the provisional over the crown prep. Okay. And then cement it with. And and then cement it with temp. With temp. temp. Okay, yeah, good. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. Everybody clear with that part? So we'll call that part one. Okay. All right, so everybody on the same page? That's part one. And then the part that we're adding on this year that's new to everybody, both me, you, the sim clinic faculty that we've never done before, is that we wanted to simulate a situation in which a patient has recurrent caries underneath the crown. Okay? So part two. The first part, the first step in that is we want to remove the crown. And classic how we do that is we split the crown in half. So we'll show you how to do that on your gold crown. And you're going to repeat that process uh, with provisional. And we have a crown separator that will end up separating the crown. And then um, it essentially look just like this picture here because the crown's off again. Okay? Clean up all the temp cement. And what we're going to assume is there's some recurrent carries between your buildup and then your tooth, right? Because that's what happens. The caries goes underneath the crown and it starts to erode away at the tooth. So when you encounter a situation like that in clinic, you always want to remove all the old buildup material plus any caries that's there because you never know what's underneath that buildup, okay? So the exercise is going to be for that part two is also remove the amalgam that you just put in. Okay, so you're going to expose everything, and then you're going to take off a little bit more tooth just to simulate maybe there's a little bit of decay there. Okay, 
And then from here, you're going to etch bond and then build that tooth back up with composite. Because that's something that we generally would do, right? Because you got to, whatever you removed, you got to kind of build back up with composite. Okay? And then you're going to prep that down for a crown. So it'll look like that, except instead of silver, it'll be white. Okay? Okay. Question. When we, when we do the, um, when we are removing the amalgam, yes. so do you want us to remove the amalgam that is in the pulp chamber as well and yes. put composite Everything, in there? Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's a good question because when you simulate this in the mouth, what needs to come out? All the, Every, all the build up material needs to come out and the decay. So by the time you're done with that, what you're trying to analyze is with the amount of remaining tooth structure left, is this tooth restorable? If so, then let's put it back together by filling it back up to the build up. So your buildup is going to be a little different than what you did with the amalgam, right? Because think about when you did your amalgam buildup. You still had all your walls available because it wasn't prepped for a crown yet. Can you visualize what that's going to look like with once you remove the amalgam? It's going to look a little different, right? So here's a principle when you build it up with composite. Just overbuild it, right? You don't need to build it to look like a tooth again. Just build it beyond, so visualize what that ideal crown prep looks like. With composite, just build it a little bit taller and maybe a little bit wider, because once it's cured, you're going to go back with your burr and then kind of do a refining of that crown preparation, okay? This is where students get confused, because when we say build up this, so this is what happens, okay? Student comes, they remove the amalgam, right? Everything's clean, we say two to restorable. And we go, okay, do your crown build up. And then they pile on composite and make it look like a tooth. You don't need to do that, right? You just need it a little bit bigger than what that crown prep looks like. I probably confused half of you guys, so let's just do it and see what happens, okay? And as you guys do it, I'll take some pictures so we can have pictures for next year, okay?